Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our second day of Flattery and Boulder Conversations. My name is Devin Lorenzing. I'm one of the co-programmers of Unwriting the Disaster and one of the, um, the Flattery NYC 2020 Programmers in Residency, along with Sunil Sanskri and Alia Eman. And I'm really, really excited to have Orsha Cobb and Nago we were just doing this before. I don't want to mess up because it's Nag Nagazi Onowa. Nagazi Onwara. <laughs> I'm glad we can all still, yeah. But um, I'm. These are two incredible filmmakers with two vital and haunting and beautiful films, and. I guess we'll just talk about check-in. How are you guys doing? Um, I think one of the most exciting things about this pairing was the fact that you both have met each other before. Um, a and, long, long time ago in a different time and space, but yes. Yeah. Uh, but I think the last time I might have seen in closely was at um, an NYU, some kind of film conference and um, there was a discussion about a book by Ben Okri that um, you loved. And I thought, yeah. yeah, the famished ones. Uh, and I had been reading that book and it was so visual. And when you mentioned it, it was like, oh my God, we love this book as visual artists, mm -hmm. you know? So it really I, helped I, me appreciate that. I call that book my Bible. It was, it's the most beautiful book, but I think it's actually unfilmable. I think it exists <laughs> within the, literary space it can't it's too your imagination has to work with the words i think now with so many um filmmakers emerging filmmakers tapping into the idea of afrofuturism i think it's a perfect text for that um, genre yeah that's actually a really interesting point to go off of these ideas of the unfilmable and also uh, Afrofuturist texts and temporalities. So um, I'm just going to put one of the questions. Um, both of these works, um, they're made in the early 90s. They're dealing with the idea of aftermath and temporality in very different ways. Mm -hmm. Orsha, your film is dealing with the aftermath of Rodney King. And it's really made as an immediate response. Well, Nagazi's film is the aftermath is more of a familial aftermath. It's more of a historical aftermath. The event that the aftermath, I think you, one could argue, and correct me if you disagree or say it differently, is the, your mother's mastectomy and that central dynamic of that relationship is reshaped, but it has occurred so far in the past and yet it's still present in the, in the moment. So how does working with past and memory and now what's I would like that in the terms of futurisms, because I know in our pre-conversation before we went live was um, the common was part of the portion of your work feels that your, your film is like everything that's being said is being said, could have easily been said just yesterday on TV. Like how mm -hmm. things function on a personal emotive level and also a political one too. I think it would be a really interesting place to start off with. And maybe also consider the unfilmable as part of that too. Mm. Um, for, should I go? <laughs> Sorry. Um, for me, I looking back on No Justice, No Peace, um, I was thinking that if I, I really struggled with title, but that, that title was present then and it's present now. It's so interesting how I couldn't have looked into the future and seen it that way. Um, and there were some other makers who used that title in between in the 90s, somewhere down the line. And it felt very personal for me right then. But um, in revisiting it and hearing the narratives again or hearing the responses from young black males that I interviewed. And and I, I think about it as it, it was a gesture of uh, the moment, you know, I was in the moment when I was taking in those uh, um, interviews and having those discussions. Um, today, if I were to rename it, I probably would, <laughs> you know, everyone now is wearing t-shirts that 
has the eight minutes, 46 seconds, you know, about the, the length of time that it took uh, for the policeman to snuff out the life of, you know, a black man. Um, for me today, I think the title would probably be what I was chanting. You know, um, they struck him 51 times in 86 seconds or, you know, I'd probably, that would probably be a subtitle of some kind, you know, more thoughtfully. Um, so I, I think about how that piece, revisiting it, also thinking about the people who were young at the time and wondering about them now. And, and there's a moment in it where I interview a young man on the grassy knoll at a university. I, he turns out to be Boots Riley <laughs> later on, you know? So he's the one that says this, he says a very intelligent thing and he's a student of Asa Hilliard. That's so remarkable looking back, you know? Um, and that he became a filmmaker later on, you know? But when I look back on it, I, I was like, oh my God, that was him. And I didn't know his nickname was Boots at the time and I knew nothing about him. So it is interesting to kind of shuttle back and forth between the past and, and the present and wonder about the future um, by looking at a text like that. Um, and for me with Body Beautiful, I mean, what Body Beautiful essentially is about is about memory and how your memory changes from the perspective and time that you're looking at. So when you talk about the aftermath, yes, it's the aftermath of her mastectomy, my mum's mastectomy, but actually it was quite a long period. It was like eight or 10 years between when she'd had, no, even longer between when she'd had the mastectomy and when um, the film is set. But the, the crucial moment at that point is that's the point where my character is becoming a woman. And so her body is going from a, from a child's body to a woman's body and then she's starting to look at her mum's body as a woman's body and then she looks back at the mm -hmm. things that were happening as she was growing and she sees things that she didn't so it's inside your memory what's happened but you you don't see them you don't notice them or you see them differently so then she sees and then that changes then the way she sees the present so when they're in the um, recreation center and there's a young man looking at her and her mum's there she sees things so, so seeing things is so subjective memory is so subjective it's so informed about the present about the future and that now um, I, I recently did um, I actually showed the film at, at MoMA in New York and um, I was in the audience with my daughter I was on the stage and my daughter was in the audience and it was this sort of very strange uh, mm -hmm. to, my mum has passed, so you're looking at it and you're see. I'm watching the film, and the film is almost a memory then. So I'm watching a film of my mother, mm -hmm. seeing it in a certain way while being in the same space as my daughter, which then informed the way I looked about. So that that's always constantly changing. And if you're making films that deal with memory, I think in a way they're the ones that stay alive the most because they they change all the time when you're um when you're watching them or dealing with them. I thought that was really, um, uh, going back and revisiting that film, we love that film. And, and the iconic image, you know, and the poster that women make movies, you know, <laughs> it's still in my film office. It's such a wonderful image. And um, so many things I loved about it. And especially in that, the way that you um, used your mother's voice and, you know, your exchange in the film, just hearing her tell her story and, and the archival elements, really um, everything about it. But that was something that I, I, I am now doing in my current work is using my mother's voice. You know, I've recorded her, mm -hmm. she's gonna be 99 this year. So it's like I've been recording her and I have this archive that I'm starting to play with. So it's it's just so empowering and I, I wondered if your mother was still living. So just to have that treasure no, yeah. you know, locked in a film like that, beautiful. No, and, and how amazing that you can actually work. Cause I, I would do, I don't know if I would make the film any differently now, but I would talk to my mother very differently now about certain <laughs> idea to be able to sit down and, and go through that. That just must be such a, a wonderful um, experience for, for you to be, to be doing that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. I think also, I mean, one thing I would be curious to like just ponder is in terms of this idea of unwriting the disaster, this act of preserving our personal histories is an act of saving our cultural identities, our cultural histories of unwriting the supremacist narratives, of writing these misogynistic narratives, of writing these colonialist narratives that live with us in so many ways and we navigate in so many ways. Um, I just, I'm not sure if that's a question or just a comment, but I, think it's just a, that I felt like that's something that both of your responses started to touch on in a way. I mean, I think the personal is, is so political without you even sometimes realizing, like I didn't, when I put together Body Beautiful, I didn't realize how many individual political, I was telling a personal story and it was actually almost just between me and my mum because um, my previous film had been a film called Coffee Colored Children, mm -hmm. which was a film about me growing up in a predominantly white, coming from Nigeria and growing up in a white space and it, my biracial identity and what and how I claimed a black identity and what that meant. And my mother, who's white, um, she felt very left out in that mm -hmm. film. And I wanted to make a film that showed, all right, I didn't get my racial identity from you I didn't get that from you but I got something else from you and this is what I got from you so it was very personal between me and my mum and then suddenly it's like you're dealing with issues of race of sexuality of disability of without it ever being that was never the the, the, the that was never the what was going what was meant to happen what was meant to be about and when I watched Portia's film um, that appears very political. It feels like the politics is what is driving it. And then it just becomes intensely personal as you're watching these people because they become people and you're thinking about them specifically, their lives, their, what happened to them, what they did. And so it's this interaction between the two that you can't draw a line between. I think in my... Um... I think my impulse always kind of directs me to think of memory and um, identity, like identity becomes, and now I think of memorial, you know? So I think of Ngozi's film as a, a memorial. Um, and I think of the work that I still haven't completed as, you know, these archives that are memorials that are, are you know, that will exist somehow. Um, but when I look back on that film in my process, I remember that I was kind of on a quest just to educate myself about why, how the media could um, infer something or impose how I saw others. You know, um, I began to um, look at young black men in a certain way, and I and I wanted to dispel whatever those myths were, you know, even though they were in my environment or whatever. I, I remember being very um, reticent at first about using the camera. And uh, there was a filmmaker who came to um, San Francisco State when I was studying film and his name was Kidlat Tahinik. He was from the Philippines. And he told me, take your camera everywhere, take your camera everywhere. And so it was like I had to get over that I started taking my camera everywhere. And then I had a purpose to ask this, these sets of questions. So there's a moment where I'm very self-conscious a couple of times when people say things that I'm not expecting, you know, um, you know, what do you want me to say? You want me, when I ask about their history or their experience as young black males and one guy says, what do you want me to talk about my, my penis or my, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> So I like had the same response watching it though again after so long. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so the spontaneity of somebody putting it plain, you know, or someone, you know, there was all the the um you know, there was a lot of dis-ease about Farrakhan speaking out on issues of young black men or speaking out on issues of community at that time in the 90s. And 
And so it could separate you from somebody, you know, like if you moved in different spaces. And I remember losing a friendship um, of a Jewish family because I took my children to a Farrakhan lecture, which was about family. But it comes out also in what people are talking about when they're being transparent, you know, and and and, and having the courage to ask certain questions and and to and and also to reveal my own vulnerability, you know. So when I look back on it, it really, it took a whole different turn when the Rodney King situation emerged because I had these interviews, but I hadn't stitched them with anything. You know, I kept thinking, what am I putting in between? What am I putting in between? And I remember coming out of the editing studio and there was tension on campus. And I'm asking people what happened. They said, didn't you hear the verdict? So that night I went home and I recorded everything I could from television, like, you know, and that it started to direct how everything was coming together. The clash of testimonials, you know, what these men were saying and what the news was saying. So it was really, um, I still think about it and I might, you know, the hair raises on my arm when I think about how I sat up all night and I saw the, the news change where the reporters were empathetic, you know, and then LA started getting burned and then they were hoodlums, they were thugs. And the same thing is happening, you know. Have you thought about revisiting it? Cause it felt really cry, it felt really, it, should, it could be revisited. You could use that footage and intersect, intercut it with new footage from now because it felt so relevant and so of the moment. Have you ever thought? I, I, I think I am beginning to think on that um, as a maybe a collaborative process, you know, um, because a lot of people are taking a lot of images. I haven't been to any of the marches, you know, during COVID or anything, but they're happening in my city. I live in Milwaukee, you know, um, so there is a lot a lot of social imagery and a lot of things that are being said that certainly cross fertilizes with the discussions that are going on and the testimonials, you know, um, that, yeah, when I look back on them, it's so present. And even just the use of the, the numbers, the times, because I don't know if you saw the Dave Chappelle piece where he just yeah. kept, kept saying that, that eight right. and, and it just, and it reminded me of that. And I just thought, Oh my goodness, you could really do some kind of yeah, cross. Cross. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'd forgotten how many, it was 56 times in 81 seconds, you know. And, and in my process, I just remember like every day I turned on the news, we had to see that same footage again and again. The same thing, you know, with uh, Dave Chappelle calling out the eight minutes, 46 seconds. Um, that, you know, we're seeing this man struggle for breath. Um, so yeah, very much, uh, made it come alive again, you know, to revisit it. You could find a young filmmaker who'd been there at the time and then you both kind of like, so it could be cross-generational, but we, we I need you here. You can help me come and produce it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that idea. I'm writing that down. <laughs> I'll produce it. <laughs> um, I guess just one other question before we open up to audience comments is actually all of our questions really are <laughs> time and discuss. You guys just like went in, went at it in the best way possible, and you guys just really touched upon everything from representation of gender, sexuality, race to mediated images of the media. Like we really, oh, Sunil, who is our programmer, one of our co-programmers, has a great question. I think a lot about the continuity of conversations across generations of filmmakers, and specifically filmmakers in the African diaspora. Who are some of the filmmakers you are most excited about now? Wow. Ooh, that's exciting. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I mean, Barry Jenk. I mean, I'm going to be very, like, I'm not the radical, whatever. Any, I mean, you know, I, Barry Jenkins made me just, uh, 
took me to it. It was they were beautiful films. They were beautiful, stunning uh, films. Uh, I I really like Ava. I still actually haven't watched um, thirteen. No, I've watched what? that, but I haven't watched the uh, when they see us or they when see they see us. us. Mm -hmm. I can't. The trailer made me cry so much. I couldn't even watch. But then, you know, she's done interviews where she says, you know, people need to watch things. You you see so much pain. You see so much. So much and as a mother, to see, you know, in the trailer, there's a scene where the son goes, one of the boys goes, is my mom here? And it's just that broke me, so I can't watch it. So um, um, there's a British filmmaker called Destiny Akaraga, who um, she is, and literally excited to see what uh what films um she's done short she's done two feature films mm. and um she's she's a nigerian brit oh. um but yeah there's there's a lot of them out there i don't i don't i probably won't remember names uh but i you know the films that i love um the burial of kojo um you oh, know God. seeing Seeing these filmmakers emerge in short form, also like you know, uh, music videos, Beyonce, you know, is introducing a lot of uh, visual culture, sound that I enjoy. Um, I really love that that little film, The Burial of Kojo, um, and its dreamlike quality. You know, the things that. Um, the, it's surreal. I like the temporality of it, you know. Um, I, it's interesting because I'm still teaching that the films that I love, I have to kind of, I, I introduce them in a certain way because I know that there are elements of the film that I love that maybe is coming from what I loved in the past, <laughs> you know. Um, time and storytelling, you know, like we were just talking about the famished road, that things are taking you through time and that you're able to enjoy them, that it's not like in, in, in sharing no justice, no peace, I feel like I have to give, maybe not so much right now, but I've had to give context so that my students will not expect it to be quick cuts. <laughs> you know, there, there I am chanting this, 56 times in 81 seconds and you know and I'm looking at them to see how they're paying attention you know um so I think that the movies that I enjoy take time and uh storytelling like The Last Black Man in San Francisco I love that film you know I could watch it again and again and there are things about it and the acting I think I'm looking at the actors now and really feeling like they're given a chance to to be themselves, to be authentic. Do you think, oh, sorry, and go, you go first. I just want to uh, just remind me also of Atlantics, that whole- um, Yes, Natty um, job. That, that's not dealing with time, that's dealing with time in a different, that Afrofuturist, is, is it Afro, yeah. Afrofuturistic way? And just, it was slower, you took your time to go through it, you got to know the people and then they changed because people do that and then you didn't know what world you were in and then you were in that world and then everything makes sense and nothing, makes, it was so beautiful and it was, so, um, and that's so exciting that that it seems like, the same with Kojo, it seems like there's also a generation, you know, this, amongst the generation of filmmakers, they're playing with these notions of, of um, narrative structure and time and, and memory and place and that you know growing up in Africa that idea that the line between what is real and what isn't real that that space mm -hmm. is, is very undefined and very fluid and you go backwards and forwards and it's present with you all the time when you see that in films which I think you see in both those films mm. um, that's almost like a memory for me when I watch when I watch it of, of my childhood mm -hmm. And I love her. Is it a thousand sons? The I think so. Oh, yeah. Future? Um, I love that film because it's speaking. It's an echo of her. You know, like she's in conversation with her uncle. You know, it. it and I. It, it's such a remarkable. There's so many moments in it that are kind of, um, you know, uh, I don't know if honoring, but sort of 
piecing together influences from, you know, Hollywood or whether it be French film or whatever, you know, but to kind of see how they play with music and, and place, like to displace where you are by playing some Western, <laughs> you know, as he's herding, you know, cattle <laughs> across the busy streets of Dakar. I just, there, there are moments in that film that I could, uh, that I really appreciate. And I feel like she's in a conversation with her uncle the whole time or that he's whispering in her ear, you know. I think one thing that's really apparent from this conversation is both of you so appreciate time, memory, these echoes, these temporalities, and that as, as your careers, as your filmmakings, as your lives are further, that, that understanding is really enriching, I think would be a, a fair word to use. And I think the question I, like something that I'm wondering too is, and it's just sort of talking about to me, like both of these films, yes, I mean, in the 90s, but yet I think they're still relevant, if not more relevant now than they were then. Like everything they're saying is still very here, but yet the perspective you both have, have as artists has seemed to not change, but like continue to grow and enrich. And as I know for myself, even like looking back from a year or two years ago, like who I was then is not who I am now. Mm -hmm. Like, do you feel your approach to form or aesthetics and process has changed in going forward with your newer works as you continue to explore these thematics? Hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I think it evolves the whole time. The the, the those copy uh, copy color children body beautiful. They were incredibly personal films, and I don't think I could make. Can you, I just couldn't keep making that intensely. Um, I I hadn't. I couldn't make that intensely. Per, continue making that intensely personal films, but um, I think. I mean, I did a I did a sidestep to to writing because the thing with filmmaking was it became so to raise the money and to make things happen for the kind of scale and the kind of stories you wanted to tell became became harder. So I think being an artist, it's informed by practical as well as what you want what you want to do and what you want to be out there, um, and. Um, but but I would still say it's always the personal informs um, everything that I would want to make. And if you, even like, you know, I got a script the other day that had nothing to do with anything in my life, but you start to find the personal inroads and then you you take the story from there. I think my films have moved or my interest has moved back to performance. Um, I know that you'd asked a question about directing. I look back on what I did and I really consider it kind of an experiment. It was experimental. It had, uh, it still had film moments in it when I was still working with film and transitioning to video, you know? So when I'm layering, I had, I'm looking, I'm like, oh, wow, I was using film there, you know? And I can look back on early work and still see that I was, transitioning to video only for the convenience, like, you know, like it was more immediate and the subtitle immediate because I needed to accomplish it. I needed to finish something. I was a single parent, you know, it was expensive uh, to shoot film and to process it or shoot it and it not turn out like you wanted it to be or whatever. Um, so I look now and I'm, my process, I think um, what I'm returning to is that performance element. Um, so work that I've done in the past couple years, um, I've had others work with me to document a performance I was actually doing where I'm actually performing. Um, there's a very short piece that I did at a, a sculpture garden here where I'm reenacting a story my mother told me of my great aunt who would pose as a character that we all grew up fearing, a hobo ghost character <laughs> called Uncle Pomp. 
<laughs> so I became Uncle Pomp to tell that story and had someone document it. And it was like a plain air performance. And I think in San Francisco, I got the bug for a performance, coupling that with what I was doing. Even in um, No Justice, No Peace, I have my daughter <laughs> striking the table. You know, um, So there are other shorts that I made along the way where there is performance in it. And I thought of my work as strictly experimental because that was the word that was introduced to my work through critique. But when I look back on it, I feel like there are narrative elements in it that I didn't see before. I wasn't aware that they, it was more narrative than, and it is, it does play with experimentation, but there is a narrative, a story there. I think we have a couple questions from the chat. Um, if we can pull those up. I sense a lack of communication between American, African, Brazilian, and Caribbean filmmakers, even knowing that the experience of modernity is shared between us. Do we, do we have some kind of association? And the lead in question to that, which I'm not sure we could pull up the one before that was, do you think that it's possible to create a global diasporic film movement? <laughs> That's a. I'll let you guys have that one. <laughs> hmm. um, Great question, though. That's a really interesting question. I think these works really speak to a really open side. I felt like we, in the 90s, that there was a movement like that. I felt like I was looking to Black British filmmakers at the time. You know, the idea of collective, of collaborative. And even now, I think about how that still informs uh, how I think about the diaspora, about belonging, about being a global citizen in this time when monuments are coming down and, you know, people are openly expressive about what they want to see, you know, in the future. And I, I rewind the tape back in my mind of the, the Black British film movement in response to rebellion, in response to things that made me, that motivated me, or that made me feel less isolated. You know, as a result, I helped found a collective of film uh, filmmakers when I was still in grad school, and we called ourselves Focus, and we're still connected and the and the one thing connecting us was this, uh, you know, the Black British film movement that it said Black, but it, other people belonged. It wasn't just about being Black, you know. So I'm I'm looking at what I see now on the streets and what I see, you know, if people could just kind of understand that because of uh, the oppression, because of the things that we're dealing with, that there is commonality and as artists, that I, I feel that there is momentum for that. And maybe there always has been when we're looking to third cinemas and Africa and, you know, we're looking at Latin American cinema. We've always had a conversation um, and we've always been inspired by one another. And I think now access is, is, is better. In the 90s, it was amazing that it was so supportive. You met people, the, 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 the conversations were great. You, you could talk about the specifics. Like I knew I met a lot of um uh, French Franco African filmmakers, and they would tell you their stories about, you know, what what sort of what how their films were made. But it was still it was only possible really to see the films in like an academic setting or a festival setting, which uh -huh. didn't make for a sort of organic global movement. If you were already kind of just having that, you know, kind of elite sort of band that could see the actual work um what i get excited about now is that you know i, I don't want to plug a big corporation but like netflix really has mm -hmm. opened up like my son is 17 and he's interested in filmmaking and he goes to a, a school with a lot of white people there and everything but the the access that they they, they talked about kojo they these 17 year old kids yeah mm -hmm. with completely sort of different backgrounds had, you know, probably bored one night, flicking through, find it. There's access, the the, the, the Nollywood films that are coming through. Um, 
so I think the access is the access is there to make it to make it happen, but I also don't think I think it has to be um, it has to, it has to be everybody's individual stories, and then we find the connections by watching them, not trying to make the like having a sort of set of criteria about what makes it um, diasporic or what makes it global. We will find those connections ourselves just by having the access to see the work and then because you know they communicate it's so easy to communicate with people now it's like you just sort of you see something you can actually connect when I remember trying to connect with different filmmakers when I was there when I was sort of starting you had to wait till you went to a festival or something or somebody had to know somebody but now you can like you know inbox people till they um <laughs> they want to get rid of you totally <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> I, I think about the LA Rebellion, you know, filmmakers and how present they are in curriculum today and that they're still making work, you know, so that work is still celebrated and, and taught. And I think of my own not knowing, like when I discovered who was a part of that movement at different times, it wasn't just one time, it was over a period of time, but becoming acquainted with the work when I couldn't see it by reading a script or a screenplay <laughs> before I could actually see the film. So I, today is so different, like you, there it is, Netflix or Criterion or whatever you have access to that you can actually see something that you read about or you knew existed, but you could never see it. And for myself, like you know, I've been watching Charles Burnett. The, the access now to see, to put it contextually as well, from memory, to put the mm -hmm. sort of works from then to the works to now. Like, during, um, uh, it, it's. I'm hopeful. Yeah, me too. I just, I just want to say I loved everything both of you said because I'm in grad school now, and these are a lot of the concerns I'm feeling, and navigating, and it's all a lot. The same respond. We don't have the time. I just want to say I think those were just brilliant and really pinpoint some incredibly important things that we do not discuss in our filmmaking community. Um, we have another question. Can so thank you for this conversation for Portia. Have you seen I May Destroy You? If so, does anything in that show make you think of the Black British films of the '90s that captivated you? Huh. I don't know if it makes me think uh, think of the past. I just think she's really a brave storyteller. She makes me think of my youngest daughter, <laughs> you know, who is out in the world and is of her generation. Or you know, I can see how those stories relate to you know the lives of young people, and that she's so brave to tell the story about you know sexual. Uh, assault, abuse. Um, it took me a moment to get into it. Um, I will admit, you know, um, because of place, just being displaced in a way, but not long after. But, but I feel that it definitely is a mirror of her time and of this time. You know, it addresses uh, gender and assault, not just with one gender, but, you know, we're also looking at, you know, her best friend and, and what happens with him. So, I don't know if I would relate it to the past as much. I didn't, um, and Gosley, didn't, did you have, um, didn't you write something for TV? Have you written for television, British TV in the no. past? No. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the shorter things, yeah, not the yeah. full. Oh, yes. Not so, like the series. No, no, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, no. I di I've directed a lot for British television. Oh, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, no, I have written. Sorry, I have written. What was your What was the point you wanted to make? About that? I guess I was saying, like, in contrast to what's being written now as a full series, a full on mm -hmm. series, and looking at what I might have been aware of that existed, BFI, British Film Institute, or something that was British television. It's just a different way of meeting that work. You know, it's 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 a different way of meeting the work. No, and it's a it's a huge step forward in as much as like what we used to, there was a lot of space, not a lot, but there was space for sort of half an hour 
one-offs within a program of shorts and things like that but to make the transition either to full length pieces or this you know a series of pieces that is um that is moving forward somewhat <laughs> do you think there's space for that in american television um yes yeah. Yes, I, I think I'm seeing new forms like Watchmen. Everybody's talking about Watchmen, you know. And I just heard one of the writers interviewed yesterday and I was like, I really have to pay more attention. I need to go back and revisit it. Maybe I only saw the uh, episode six that everybody was talking about, but now I'm interested in really entering it differently because when it kind of takes off and it looks to me like sci-fi, I mm -hmm. kind of step back a little bit you know i'm like i don't know if i'm ready for that but now i'm i see it differently because of the narratives that are being introduced that are historical you know um so i i can enjoy it for that and and enter it differently and meet it differently no when i when i watched that i just because i just watched it recently because i'm not a big sci-fi person and we didn't have, we don't have it. We've just gotten HBO now. But when they offered it free, they offered it free for that weekend um, when when everything happened. And it was just amazing to watch it. It was like just incredible to see all the parallels, to see the way it was done, to see the boldness of the writing about of it. Yes. It was, mm -hmm. and, um, and she's brilliant. I mean, Regina King is the. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The leader. Mm -hmm. It's just all inspiring. It's really all encompassing. It's for sure you need to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question. Um, okay. So I'm not sure we can pull it up yet, but the question is funding in the UK has been very different from the US. Okay. Funding in the UK has been very different than that in the US where filmmakers are on their own for the most part. I know this is changing though, and then it's continues into the second one. As in the UK, funders are not as helpful as they used to be. So how do we find new ways to afford to tell our stories? Hmm. I remember when I used to come to, I, I live in America now, so I'm a bit out of touch with the, I know it, it has changed, it's definitely not, from the, from the way it was in the 90s when I first started making films. And I remember coming over to America and American filmmakers always being really sort of independent and independent black filmmakers always being very jealous of what was going on in the UK. But us coming from the UK didn't feel like it was a situation that people should be jealous of um, because it felt, um, I guess it's a case of you don't know what you've got till it's... Um, till it's gone but what it did sort of you know americans american filmmakers they started you know from spike lee from and that whole idea of you know take your credit card out just go <laughs> do make it rather than sit and wait for the application to be filed and for somebody to read it and someone to do it um and i think that's sort of a continuation of what's what's going on now in, in america but it's also what's starting from my understanding as a person who isn't based in the UK anymore. It's a bit of what's happening in the UK now, mm -hmm. and I think it's gonna get worse. I think the funding, although I think people are going to want to hear our stories for a minute at the moment as well. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. might, we should all jump on that because I think right now there's a sort of a strong desire, feeling, impetus to hear from us. Goodness knows how long that will last. Um, and, you know, I don't know how it will manifest itself in America versus in, in Britain. I think another thing that's happening is it, it reminds me of uh, coming when I came from California, from Oakland and moved to Milwaukee to teach here. Um, my my primary responsibility, I taught one class in the Department of Film, but I my task was um, directing a community media project. And so that meant that I went into the community and worked with young people. And so everything was collaborative. They had the stories already, we had the equipment and we had the training. And so we told our stories and it was more about not, of providing access, 
now everybody has cell phones, you know? So it's like people are, young people are telling their stories, they're making movies. Um, you know, I think about myself not, uh, of not thinking of myself as having a budget, you know, when <laughs> I made <laughs> work, I was just using my resources to get something done and then show it in a festival. And that was how our work got known. Um, now I'm seeing people shoot things. Uh, they can, you know, uh, cross the boundaries of whatever we thought that was of being acknowledged or, you know, from festival to festival or whatever. The fact that they can produce something and they can reveal it in I, IGTV or, or something of that nature. Um, but also that there's more, I, I see the collaborative thing happening again, you know, talented film students coming out of school recently form their own companies, you know, and they don't stay put, they can go other places now. They're, they're brave, they will move from here to wherever, Los Angeles or wherever, and produce together. And they know that their strengths are as a collective. Um, so I think that there's a lot of promise in, when I look back, what the community media project was, was grassroots storytelling, um, putting tools in the hands of young people to tell their stories. When I look at my history in Milwaukee, I go, you know what, my mission here really, I mean, people can now program their own films, you know, they can bring filmmakers here. There's a whole black lens component to the Milwaukee Film Festival. It's amazing the growth that I've seen and I've been here 28 years, but I just, think of the landscape of film and storytelling and where we were and where we are now, where we're going, you know, where young people are going with storytelling. Does anyone have any final questions? Or any final thoughts? I just realized you're talking to us, aren't you? Not the people out. <laughs> Are you talking to us? I thought you were talking to the audience. <laughs> any, any, any last statements? No, thank you for having us. It was, um, it was, it was great to revisit your work, um, Portia. That was like, um, and I, I, I watched quite a few when I got the link for the festival. I watched quite a few. And um, it was stimulating because it's a long time since I've been to a festival now because firstly there aren't any and, and that feeling of seeing those sort of works that you don't have the same, that aren't in your face the whole time was was um, was great. Yeah, and I, I thank you I to revisit Body Beautiful. And, and I wondered like, how can I see it? You know, before I knew that we were going to be in this conversation together. So it was refreshing. I still love the film very much. I love the narratives. Um, there's a lot of tension in it. Um, it's a very stimulating um, story. And it reminds me of, even though maybe you've moved away from the personal in the way that it was, I really treasure that the story exists and that you shared it with us. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, thank you both so much. What are you working on next? And that's from Eric. I'm writing at the moment. I mean, I, I, I started writing a novel, which I finished the first draft, put it to one side. I was about to start a short and um, uh, a short set in Los Angeles and uh, just to get back into the swing of things, but then the pandemic came along. Um, so I might actually do one in the UK um, because the, the situation in the UK seems to be a bit uh, better in terms of actually getting a, a low budget production off the ground because in America, I'm not sure which way it's gonna go in terms of all the excess extra costs that are gonna be involved with um, mounting a low budget, all the sort of COVID things you have to put into, up, um, so this the script in England is a script I didn't write. The one that I was gonna do in LA was something that I had written. Mm. And Terradome has just, my feature film has just been picked up by Criterion. Oh, so, yay, we yay. Have to see it. <laughs> <laughs> in the process of working out like, when it'll go and what kind of, um, so look out for that. We're gonna do some promotion and look out for sort of things around Terradome. Looking forward to that, that's a wonderful, congrats. 
And I'm working um, as an artist in residence uh, through the Linden Sculpture Garden here in Milwaukee. And I'm doing a collaborative project that I wanted to realize this summer, but we're going to, I'm working with a sculptor. There's going to be some performative aspects that will be um, filmed. And um, I'm really interested in the notion of rite of passage. And I'm using my mother's story about <laughs> seeking and she's from South Carolina. So they called it seeking. And I'm making these comparisons. I've just visited uh, Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in kind of, revisiting this masking of the Sunday, of the the uh, the woman figure, the woman under the mask and how she exemplified uh, grace and beauty for young girls who were becoming young women. So I really wanna play with that imagery. I don't know where it's gonna take me and I need to finish things that I haven't completed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wish it was something called a uh, break a leg for filmmakers. <laughs> yeah. Break a reel. <laughs> <laughs> the reel was broken a long time ago. <laughs> this was such. <laughs> My dog recently chewed up a digital <laughs> you know, memory oh. card. Oh. I don't know what was on it. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're sadly out of time, but this was such a lovely, amazing, insightful conversation with you both. And Gozi, Portia, thank you both. If anyone who's watching this now has not watched Portia and Gozi's films, please do. They'll be streaming to the 18th, and they're just wonderful joys. Thank, thank you. It was a pleasure. It was great. Thank you great so much. Great to see you again. <laughs> great to meet you both. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Great. Yeah.